All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. I'm Senator Tom Brewer, representing the 43rd Legislative District of Western Nebraska. Uh, I serve as the chair of this committee. The committee will take up bills uh, in the order posted on the agenda. Our hearing today is your public part of the legislative process. This is your opportunity to express your positions on proposed legislation before us. The committee members may come and go during the hearing. This is just part of the process. We have bills to introduce in other committees. I ask that you abide by the following procedures to better facilitate today's meeting. Turn off or silence your phones or electronic devices. Um, please move forward to the reserved chairs when you are ready to testify on your bill. Those are the chairs in the front row. The introducing center will make the initial remarks, uh, followed by proponents, opponents, and those in the neutral testimony. Closing remarks are reserved for the introducing senator. If you're planning to testify, please pick up one of the green sheets, fill it out legibly so it goes in the record correctly, and then uh, be prepared to turn the green sheet in when you come forward. If you're here and you don't plan to testify but want a record of it, there's a white sheet on the table that you can fill out. If you have handouts, we'd ask that you provide 10 copies. If you don't have them, pages can help you make more copies. Bring those forward when you bring the green sheet forward and uh, give that to the pages. When you come up to testify, please speak clearly into the microphone. Tell us your name and then spell both your first and last name. So that goes accurately into the record also. Uh, how many are here to testify today? All right, we'll go five minutes and I'll trust you. But if you get done on three, I will like you better. Okay. We're going to use the light system. You have five minutes, <clears throat> four minutes green, one minute yellow. And then when it come, turns red, you'll get a light. And soon after that, you will get an alarm also that will tell you that you're done. No displays of support or opposition to a bill, vocal or otherwise, are allowed at this public meeting. We will go ahead and get started by introducing the centers that are here today. Again, we got folks doing things in other committees or not in today, so we will start with Senator Sanders. Good afternoon, Rita Sanders, representing District 45, which is the Bellevue Offit community. John Lowe, District 37, Carney Gibbon, and Shelton. Good afternoon, Steve Heller, and representing District 33, which is Adams, Kearney, and Phelps County. Megan Hunt, District 8, in the northern part of Midtown Omaha. Senator Sanders is Vice Chair. Dick Clark is League of Counsel. Julie Conan is the Committee Clerk. And this afternoon, we got Logan and Audrey. Very good. With that, we will go to our first bill of the afternoon. <laughs> And uh, let's see, it is LB 293, and uh, Margaret will be uh, introducing it for Senator Kavanaugh. Margaret, please. Thank you, Senator Brewer and members of the committee. My name is Margaret Buck, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-B-U-C-K. I am the legislative aide for Senator Michaela Kavanaugh. She represents <laughs> District 6 in Omaha. LB 293 is a reintroduction of a bill that former Senator Mark Coulterman introduced earlier to allow a formal protest procedure for large state contracts. Currently, the only process we have is a protest letter going to the department that the protest is about. It's not a true appeal. Uh, Senator Coulterman and his staff, Tyler Mayhood, um, put a great deal of work and research into it, and I'm going to quote some of the things that they came up with. Um, one example they gave was from 2007 when DAS selected a company to perform a complex long-term Medicaid managed information system contract valued at more than $50 million a year. The award was protested on the basis that the company awarded the contract was not responsible. That means they didn't have the ability to perform the work. That was one of other reasons. That pro, uh, protest was rejected. Less than two years later, however, the contract was terminated for non-performance after paying the company more than $7 million. In 2018, another contract was awarded to a company who did not perform. That contract was for the eligibility and enrollment system, 
The cost to the state was $6 million plus $54 million in federal funds. That case went to court with the state alleging that the company deliberately underbid the contract and <clears throat> misrepresented itself. That contract too was protested and the protest was rejected by the department. LB 293 would require that regulations be written for formal protest procedures and incorporated into the Administrative Procedures Act. It requires a hearing and an appeal process. The appeal could only be used after the other administrative remedies had been exhausted. This would apply to contracts for services awarded in excess of $10 million. I know LB 461 is coming up next. It implements the recommendations of a consultant on how to improve the procurement process itself. This bill though, LB 293, takes the next step requiring that formal protest and appeal process. Senator Kavanaugh believes that both bills are necessary. Thank you. She believes the formal protest process will improve the quality of the bids that the state receives and give us one more opportunity for department leaders to be making better choices. Um, this is the handout she wanted handed out. It's a article written several years ago by several Kutak Rock attorneys about the procurement process in Nebraska. And it points out dangers that to the actual companies doing the bidding on Nebraska contracts because of several things in the procurement process, but also a lack of a formal protest procedure. Um, having this protest procedure and appeal process would improve the process and I think get better quality uh, bids for services in Nebraska. Senator Kavanaugh asks you to support this bill. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, traditionally, we don't ask any questions because you're here filling in and that's not very fair to you. So we'll go ahead and start with proponents to LB 293. Come on up. Welcome to the government committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Senator Brewer and members of the Government, Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. My name is Monica Gross, M-O-N-I-K-A-G-R-O-S-S. -S. I'm here representing myself and I'm here in support of LB 293. Two years ago, I appeared before this committee testifying in support of LB 61 introduced by Senator Coulterman, which is nearly identical to LB 293. At that time, the procurement process had failed the state of Nebraska. Its taxpayers, vulnerable children and families who relied on child welfare services in the Eastern service area, as well as dedicated child welfare professionals who work in the field every day. There have been several high profile procurement failures in, in Nebraska in recent memory, and two of them since 2017 involved the Eastern service area child welfare contracts. We all know the result of that disastrous procurement failure. The successful bidder suffered unsustainable financial losses after knowingly submitting an unreasonably low bid and even after receiving a new contract with additional funding, they could not perform to a minimum standard of quality until DHHS terminated the contract in December 2021, less than one year into the new contract term. And it all could have been avoided. On the sidelines, it was like watching a train wreck in slow motion and knowing there was nothing you could do to stop it. In 2019, after DHHS awarded a five-year contract to St. Francis Ministries based on their unreasonably low bid, PromiseShip, the unsuccessful bidder, filed a protest with the Department of Administrative Services, arguing that St. Francis's cost proposal was unrealistically low that DAS had failed to qualitatively review the cost proposals, that DAS had failed to make a meaningful comparison of the two proposals, and that St. Francis's proposal was not responsive to the RFP because it violated Nebraska law. On the same day that DHHS signed a five-year contract with St. Francis, uh, DAS rejected Promise Ship's proposal, uh, Promise Ship's protest leaving no opportunity for Promise Ship to request a meeting with the Director of Administrative Services before the contract 
became effective and as provided in the DAS vendor manual, <clears throat> the final step in the current protest process. There are lingering effects of that entirely avoidable disaster. First and foremost is the impact that it had on children and families who have languished in the system, who have churned through numerous caseworkers and extended their time to achieve permanency. Then there's the child welfare workforce, already reeling from the numerous transitions and uncertainties that plagued the system for so many years. The result of all this was that fully trained caseworkers left the field for good, other professionals lost jobs that they loved, or they lost benefit accruals, seniority, or vesting rights in employer-sponsored retirement plans as a result of constantly um, transitioning to new employers. And the taxpayers of Nebraska ended up paying more money for inferior services that have had real world consequences for children and families involved in the child welfare system. There are other costs as, as well, including the opportunity cost to the state of Nebraska uh, from having uh, companies nationwide come in and bid on contracts in the state of Nebraska. There's also the harm to reputation across the country of the state of Nebraska when we don't have a fair protest process in place. A formal protest process would increase transparency and confidence in the procurement process for both bidders and taxpayers. It would also result in more businesses willing to do business with the state of Nebraska because they would feel like they are being treated fairly. Fraudulent bidding and underbidding would be deterred because of the increased scrutiny provided under the Administrative Procedure Act and an appeal to the district court. We need a state procurement system that is fair and transparent. We need to encourage more businesses to consider doing business with the state of Nebraska. And we need to protect vulnerable citizens in Nebraska from unscrupulous bidders. A fair process that includes formal uh, protest procedures would go a long way toward addressing the need for fairness, transparency, and competition in government contracting. And LB 293 is a good start on that path. The taxpayers and the children deserve no less. I urge the committee to advance uh, LB 293, and I want to thank Senator Kavanaugh for uh, introducing this legislation. Thank you. All right, thank you. And and thanks for that kind of a Reader's Digest version of what happened, because a lot of folks over time, it kind of fades exactly what happened in, in those events. And, we need to we need to make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, questions. Oh, yes, Thank you, Chairman Muir. I don't have a question, but I remember you coming in the past and testifying about this. And um, I just want to thank you for for coming back and keeping this fresh in our minds, as Chairman Brewer said. Thank sure. you. Yeah, you did a very nice job. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming in and testifying. Thank you. All right, uh, any. Additional proponents for LB 293. All right, we'll switch to opponents to LB 293. Tomorrow, welcome back to the government committee. Hello, thank you. I have a cushy five minutes now. And yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, use it all of them. I'll try and stay in your good graces. Um, all right. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Brewer and members of the committee. Um, I sat before the committee this morning. Hello again. Um, for the record, my name is Amara Block, A-M-A-R-A-B-L-O-C-K. I am the material administrator for the state of Nebraska, and I am here to speak in opposition to LB 293. Uh, this last summer, the Department of Administrative Services and the Nebraska Legislature selected and hired an independent third-party consultant, ICASO Consulting, which you will hear more about with LB 461, to review our state procurement operations, including protests. Uh, what the report found was that while there was room for improvement in our protest procedures, they were not out of line with comparable states. Uh, ICASO ultimately recommended that changes be made on a policy level as opposed to a statutory one, but in either case, um, we should avoid making the protest procedures more rigorous and complex. Uh, this was due to a number of concerns, um, including but not limited to, that complex protest procedures can incentivize protests, 
uh, they can create barriers for small businesses and less resource vendors and can lead to significant delays in contract transitions and business operations. Uh, DAS agrees with ICASA's findings and does not want to incentivize protests or disadvantage small businesses. Um, furthermore, uh, should this bill pass, DAS does not currently have the resources to handle new contested case protests as evidenced by our fiscal note. Uh, that being said, DAS is committed to adopting all of ICASA's recommendations in modifying our protest policy, which includes consolidating the control of protest policy under SPB of the State Purchasing Bureau, having the State Purchasing Bureau handle all protests, regardless of which agency bids it, establishing grounds for protests in policy, permitting protests earlier in the process, waiting to contract until the protest process is complete unless the DAS director or designee approves and permitting bidder debriefs. We believe these are strong recommendations that would benefit both the state and vendors um, without the negative consequences that would be brought about by complex protest procedures as presented in the bill. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. I also have the excerpt from the um, ICASA report um, about protest procedures that I can pass out if anyone wants to read that portion. And I have a quick request for you, Mara. Is it impossible to get your testimony? And just because I didn't keep up with all the stuff and I didn't want to not have, have sure. it recorded, so I had everything down. And we don't need it right now, yes. just when, whenever we can. Good. Yep. Time. I'll, uh, I have some scribbles on mine, so I'll, I'll uh, clean it up and. Yeah, give us uh, a clean one, too. Yes. Okay. Uh, questions for Mara. All right. Thank you for your Great. testimony. Thank you. All right, uh, any other opponents to LB 293? Then we will go to those in the neutral. Okay, well, uh, Senator Kavanaugh. Um, by the way, Margaret did a very nice job of opening for you. <laughs> Thank you, she certainly does. I don't know if you know, but I snagged her up before Senator Avalor returned to the legislature. So, <laughs> all right, well, you did good. Uh, she previously served when he ser served with him when she he served. So, um, I just I'm sorry I wasn't here to open. I was across the hall. We actually haven't adjourned for lunch yet in HHS. So, um, I just wanted to come back to give you an opportunity if there were any further questions um, around this. I think it's pretty straightforward that. What I'm seeking is a protest process. Um, there is a litigation currently happening around the managed care organization's protest uh, or contract award. Um, I, I also tried to catch the last testifiers of everything that they were talking about, changes and improvements. Um, unfortunately, those things are not being enacted currently with our, our current uh, procurement process, which is again, leading us to litigation. Um, there has been an injunction put on the procurement process for our contracts with the managed care organizations, and there will be a hearing set in June. Uh, our Department of Health and Human Services does not have to move forward. They could extend the current contracts for a year and re-bid. They are choosing to not do that. So clearly, we have an issue with uh, even using in our current bounds good judgment, in my opinion. But I will leave it there and let you ask if you have any questions. And for those of us that are a little bit long in the tooth, this bill is very similar to the one that Mark Coulterman had? Yes. Okay. All right, questions for Senator Kavanaugh. All right, you're going to get out of easy. Uh, yes, so. Go we back might get a lunch HHS. break now. <laughs> back to HHS, yes. Right, Thank well, you. Have, have, a, have a fun afternoon over there. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, we need to read into the record on 297. We have uh, three proponents, no opponents, and zero in the neutral. With that, we will reset for LB 461. And welcome the speaker to the government committee. Speaker Arch, welcome to the government military and veterans affairs committee. Thank you, Senator Brewer. 
Good afternoon, Senator Brewer, members of the Government, Military, and Veterans Affairs Committee. For the record, my name is John Arch, J-O-H-N-A-R-C-H. I represent the 14th Legislative District in Sarpy County, and I'm here this afternoon to introduce LB-461. LB-461 was brought to me by the Department of Administrative Services, and it is the culmination of events and legislative action that has taken place over the past several years. This is a very technical bill. I am going to let DAS touch on those aspects. What I want to talk about in my opening is how we got here. For background, and you heard a little bit of that um, from a previous testifier, Ms. Gross, for background during the 2021 legislative session, the body adopted Legislative Resolution 2129, which was introduced by Senator uh, Michaela Cavanaugh, which created a special committee, the Eastern Service Area Child Welfare Special Investigative and Oversight Committee. That's a mouthful also known as the LR29 committee, to examine the state's contract with St. Francis Ministries for Child Welfare Case Management Services in the Eastern Service Area. St. Francis was awarded the contract in 2019 after submitting a proposal that was about 40% below that of the longtime incumbent contractor. By the time the LR29 committee was created, St. Francis was financially unstable and had a number of serious performance deficiencies. The contract with the state would eventually be terminated. The LR29 committee joined with the legislature's Health and Human Services Committee in holding a series of listening sessions and hearings, which I chaired, as well as identifying past procurement failures in 2007 and 2014. What became clear that while St. Francis had significant internal issues specific to them that prevented it from properly functioning, it was Nebraska's procurement process that allowed St. Francis to be awarded the contract in the first place and we saw that pattern in 2007 and 2014, where you had a low bidder that was awarded a contract, unable to perform, more money provided, and eventually just stopped. And, and we did not receive the product. One of the primary conclusions of the committee was that the state needed to reform its procurement system support to support better decision making in the future. In response to the LR29 committee findings, I introduced LB1037 during the 2022 session. The bill, which was passed and signed into law, directed DAS in consultation with the legislature to hire a contractor with expertise in procurement to conduct an in-depth analysis of the state's procurement process. On June 17, 2022, DAS entered into a contract with ACASO Consulting. The CASA reviewed state statutes, rules, reports, and manuals, and conducted extensive interviews that included procurement stakeholders and legislators. On November 15th, the CASA issued its final report, which included 33 recommendations, many focused on internal policies and procedures, but statutory revisions were included as well. And LB 461 reflects the recommendations put forth in the report. For me, the two components of the bill that really get to the heart of the St. Francis issue are, are these. And by the way, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a very technical bill. And, and so DAS has a lot of understanding of some of the technicalities. But what we saw in the St. Francis investigation was that there were certain things that biased the procurement process to award the contract to St. Francis. And I know that Senator Coulterman and I had a lot of discussions about the appeals process. He was involved in interviews with ACASO. He was current senator when, when the ACASO uh, consulting um, uh, was going on. And so um, he was involved in that. And, and what the two, the two major components that this bill does address, in my mind, are the establishment of responsibility as a standalone yeah. factor, Current language states that competitively bid contracts shall be made to, quote, the lowest responsible bidder. You'll find that in Section 8, which is page 6 of, of your bill. And so the question that, that Ms. Gross had in the previous testimony about responsible, that, is, that, is, that was a big issue. Could, can the department simply identify that responsibility and, and, and in, in effect... Um, can stop stop negotiations and stop discussions with that with that bidder if not responsible, but that term lowest responsible bidder, I believe is a, is a biased is a bias towards that forty percent as in this case in St. Francis's case of forty percent below the other bidder, and and it biased it. 
they now is a state that now is a standalone is a standalone um, factor. And by the way, page seven of your bill is is another is another section that talks about how to determine responsibility. So that's equally important. The other the other section is the ability for bids to be evaluated for realism and reasonableness. As drafted, this bill allows for price realism and price reasonableness to be grounds to disqualify a bidder. And that's section 10 on page nine. Two very important, two very important, um, I guess, to evaluate for both the realism and, and, and the reasonableness, very important factors. While all the recommendations of the report will improve our procurement process, these two provisions are key. Had emphasis been placed on the most responsible bidder as opposed to the lowest responsible bidder, it is likely that St. Francis contract, in addition to other contracts, would not have been entered into in the first place. Our current statutes automatically put too much weight in favor of the lowest bidder. While we must be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars, we also must make sure we are entering into contracts with responsible bidders. Additionally, allowing for the rejection of bids for which the price is not realistic or is not reasonable, and that is too low or too high, it will go a long ways in protecting the state from entering the contracts at the beginning of the process, as opposed to after the contract has become more costly and problematic. I do want to address the issue of appeals. I know the bill you heard before this establishes a formal appeals process in statute for contested contracts. LB 461 does not take this approach. According to the CASA report, which I think you received a copy of, this, of that section, past procurement challenges have focused on the procurement process itself and not on the protest procedures. States that have statutorily adopted formal protest procedures have created a process that is complex and costly, actually encouraging protests by well-resourced and larger vendors while creating barriers for smaller and less financially equipped vendors. These complex appeals also lead to significant delays in contract transitions. ACASO did recommend streamlining the process as a policy matter, and I believe that there were four specific recommendations there, but, but specifically recommended against putting such a process in statute. Annually, the state oversees hundreds of contracts worth billions of dollars to carry out our government functions to serve Nebraska. It has been over 20 years since we updated our procurement procedures. I think ACASO has done a thorough evaluation. I want to applaud DAS for welcoming this in-depth review and for embracing the recommendations. I'm glad to have this opportunity to introduce LB 461 on behalf of DAS and to work with the administration improving our important procurement process. I urge you to advance LB 461 and I will try to answer questions, but as I mentioned, this is a very technical bill and I would ask that technical questions be addressed to Director Jackson who will be following me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so I want to start with, with a question. So if we look at the bid process and someone comes in and say it's not an astronomically lower, you know, a 40% lower bid, but say it's it's 15, who becomes kind of the umpire to determine whether that's not a realistic bid and that the company might potentially not fulfill their responsibilities. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's part of it. There's there's technical review groups that, that meet on this, not just an individual, but there's groups that review uh, and they and and the and the bid itself is weighted according to certain factors. And so multiple people take a look at it and that that's part of the decision making process. But what this does is it is it allows for the evaluation of that realistic and reasonable. And and so that's that's a big change. Realistic and reasonable. I've got it written down right here. Yep. Too, um, low, too low or too high? All right. Let's see. We got questions for you. Questions? All right. Well, and you'll stick around for close? I will. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, our first proponent, come on up. Welcome back to the government committee. Thank you, Bill. Maybe more than five minutes. 
a little grace, but I'll do the best. We're, I can. we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna need to hear your stuff. So I've got a hunch we're gonna let you have a little extra time if need be here. So right, thank you, Colonel. I drive on. Good afternoon, Colonel Brewer and members of the committee. My name is Jason Jackson, J A S O N J A C K S O N. I'm the director of the Department of Administrative Services, and I'm here to testify in support of LB 461, the State Procurement Act. I want to begin by thanking Speaker Arch for his leadership in bringing this bill forward. This bill represents comprehensive procurement reform for the state of Nebraska. It is an end-to-end -end rewrite of a body of law that was first enacted in 1940. I think the bill is also commendable as being the product of a tremendous amount of interbranch collaboration, and the speaker spoke at, at some length about that. The bill owes its genesis to the work of the LR929 committee that looked at child welfare privatization generally and the state, or the St. Francis procurement specifically. On the recommendation of the LR29 committee, the legislature passed with the, uh, with the governor's support, LB 1037, which obligated DAS to commission an independent expert report on the end-to-end -end procurement, procurement process for the state of Nebraska. In consultation with the speaker, we selected a CASO uh, consulting to conduct that report. They brought to bear experience having contributed to reform efforts in 10 other states before working with us. ACASO was given unfettered access to the breadth of our procurement operations, documentation, procedures, past procurements, and staff. And in advance of the production of their report, they reviewed over 300 documents, conducted over 60 interviews, uh, including with members of the legislature, uh, private vendors, outside counsel, and staff on our procurement teams. They synthesized those findings, and we had published a report in, in November that identified 33 recommendations for improvements. Uh, ACASO also benchmarked with four other peer states, including Colorado, South Dakota, Iowa, and Missouri. The 33 recommendations that ACASO identified, uh, it's our intention to implement all of them. And this is where I'd like to involve your help because LB 461 uh, includes all of those recommendations that require statutory change. I want to ask that the committee not let the length of the bill obscure some of the elegance in its solutions. The bill owes its length to one of its features, which is the combination and synthesis of our goods and services statutes, which currently are in separate chapters of Nebraska law. What this bill does is it pulls them together. So there's a single source of truth and a single process and a single standard for state contracting, both with respect to goods and services. The speaker hit upon some of the key big swings that this bill takes that go to the heart of the St. Francis procurement and some other uh, past procurements that have gone awry. Um, I wanna just touch it, perhaps one click down on additional detail with those. Um, and again, the first big swing that this bill takes is a standalone responsibility analysis for vendors. Uh, we heard some of the prior testimony on the previous bill that dove into this. The current standard is lowest responsive bidder. Uh, what this bill does is it gives procurement evaluators the tool to be able to evaluate the vendor's ability to perform the work and lays out criteria for doing that, their ability, their experience. Uh, their prior performance. Um, and now that can be a standalone evaluation process that's severed from the cost analysis. So that's a big swing. The other big swing that this bill takes at our existing procurement process is this concept of cost reasonable uh, realism. Current Nebraska law provides that cost is evaluated for reasonableness. Reasonableness is an upper guardrail on a bid. So in the context of procurement law, an unreasonable bid would be the state getting swindled. It's too high. Current Nebraska law, we lack a tool for the lower guard rate, an irresponsibly low bid. And that's what this bill does. It gives us that tool, that cost realism assessment, which is just an assessment of, can the vendor realistically perform the work at the cost that they're bidding? 
So with these provisions enacted, we'll be able to have the cost evaluators will have both an upper and a lower threshold from which to address these questions. Again, that gets right at the heart of the issues in the St. Francis procurement. There's uh, three other substantive changes that I would just highlight upon. Um, the, the first of which is uh, on ACASO's recommendation, we moved the proof of need analysis to earlier in the procurement process. Current statute lays out that a proof of need needs to be basically asserted to on the, on the part of the agency that's making the procurement, basically just substantiating that yes, they need this service and why. Um, but that, that analysis happens before contract consummation. What ACASO recommended and what this bill incorporates is moving that assessment in advance of the procurement, because why even do the procurement if we can't substantiate that we have a need? That's just common sense. Um, the bill also addresses Nebraska's in-state preference for in-state contractors. Um, and if there's Q&A on this, we'd invite uh, discussion. Um, Basically, this is uh, what the what ACASO <coughs> recommended was either the complete elimination of a very convoluted process that Nebraska currently has, or its simplification. This bill elected simplification. Uh, basically, agencies that are procuring services have the choice of whether or not they want to preference Nebraska bidders. Uh, we regarded that as most closely adhering with prior legislative intent. And also, again, getting back to the St. Francis procurement, some of the discussion around that was, hey, we went with an out-of-state provider. Um, if DHHS had wished to maintain the relationship with Promoship, the opportunity to offer a in-state preference might have been an important tool that could have aided them in doing so. Um, and then finally, the bill brings Nebraska law into alignment with federal standards with respect to grant administration um, and cooperative agreements um, administration. Um, and that'll significantly aid those agencies that are heavily involved in the grant administration process. Collectively, these changes represent significant reform and a significant modernization of state procurement law um, and take significant strides to mitigating the risks that were present and contributed to the St. Francis procurement specifically. So I want to reiterate my appreciation to the leadership of Speaker Arch on this issue. Um, and further express my gratitude on the behalf of state pro uh, procurement professionals across the state that will eagerly welcome the changes that are incorporated in this bill. And with that, they'd be happy to take any of your questions. All right, thank you. Uh, obviously, you're kind of the go-to guy with knowledge on how all of this 33 recommendations and 50 pages of law uh, got all put together. So you get extra time when you're the the one that we need to ask questions to. Thank you, Colonel. No problem. Now, since all of us up here had to write law, we know that sometimes it's hard to write a two-page law without having three amendments to it. <laughs> you got 50 pages here. Yes, sir. Uh, you just put enough time in to figure it out and get it right the first time through? Or are there amendments to this? Uh, right now, we don't anticipate any. Okay. Well, yes, sir. Uh, you must have spent the right amount of time getting it figured out. Uh, let's see if we got questions for you right um, hand here. Mr. Chairman. What? Mr. Chairman. Oh, you. Up higher. <laughs> Senator Holler. I thought he was waving. I was too. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jackson, for yes, being sir. here again today. So um, I, I'm just curious. Uh, I would assume maybe you've done this, but maybe you haven't, but it seems like it would be a kind of a good test of these statutes, the proposed statutes, to run by, run through the St. Francis proposal again and see if they would have flunked. Would that be a reasonable thing to do, or is that, not, would that be too costly to do or too cumbersome to do? I mean, you know how it turned out. Mm -hmm. I get that. But if, if St. Francis's proposal came to you today, as it did when it came to us, would it uh, pass or fail? I, I think it would have failed. I, these tools were unavailable to, oh, the, to the evaluators at, DHS, at DHHS that evaluated it at that time. Um, so if the, that same evaluation team were to come back together and do, um, do it over again with the advantage of hindsight and these tools, I think you would have a different result. Well, there's a difference between I know and I think. Yep. Uh, my, my question is, would it be unreasonable? 
I know we, we know the results of St. Francis, so it's hard to take that out of our uh, out of our mind about how that turned out. But I, I'm just asking whether or not now that with these tools, I understand these tools would and should make a difference, and I, I'm anticipating they would, but it seems to me it would be kind of an interesting test. We don't test things around here very often. We just say, this should work. I think it'll work. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. Um, but it seems like it would it would take some exercise. It would take some time. But it seems like wouldn't that be a good test to see whether or not something we know in the past failed, but now that we're proposing these statutes, and I'm not against these at all. I'm a proponent of them. But whether or not, in fact, they would have said failed. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable, and I have no reticence about that. We can work with the, uh, HHS and see if we can war game that yeah. procedure. Um, I think it'd be interesting. And see what the results are. Okay. Um, I'm very confident. Again, this is uh, this is the work product of a great deal of due diligence, about 18 months of no, due, 24 uh, months of due diligence and a lot of benchmarking and thoughtful work. Um, but absolutely, we can, we can war game that and see what the results are. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions, Senator Sanders? Thank you, Mr. Jackson, for bringing this forward on all the work that you've done on this. Um, does it give you enough tools in there to look at the, the, the bids or those that have bid on your contract um, and their history? And um, I just know in our business, commercial real estate, um, sometimes those low bids, if you look at the history of, of former projects, there's a lot of change orders that can mm -hmm. certainly make up the difference of even more. Mm -hmm. So does this give you the tools to be able to go back and look at the reputation and look at the history of who is bidding on the contract? Yeah, great question. So just for the benefit of the committee, this is a common problem in, in state procurement practice is that if a contractor um, kind of bids the minimum on the scope of the project, but anticipates that it may cost more, what they'll do is they'll just kind of change order you to death. Um, and then the cost kind of creeps up to what would have probably should have been the true cost of the original bid. Um, and yes, so what this bill does with that responsibility analysis is we can examine a contractor's past performance history. And if they have a track record of engaging either with us or another public entity, where they've underbid contracts, and as a consequence, those contracts have a, a, a lot of change orders that could be considered in part of the analysis. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any additional questions, Mr. Jackson? All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, team. Okay. Let's see. We are on proponents to LB 461. Come on up. Welcome to the Government Committee. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nick Batter. I'm a member of the Associated General Contractors uh, Nebraska chapter. And just as an aside, uh, I'm an Army veteran, so just uh, wanted to thank you all for your service for our state's veterans. Okay, now, this veteran, you're, you're going to have to be a veteran with attention to detail. I need you to spell your name for us. Yes, sir. Uh, B-A-T-T-E-R. N-I-C-K? Yes, sir. All righty. I'll give you a NATO alphabet if you like. Got it. Thank you. LB 461 is a bill intended to clean up state contracting and incorporate the recommendations of a DAS study authorized by last year's uh, LB 1037. AGC supports this bill. However, I am testifying to point out one concern with the bill, which would create serious unintended consequences if this language becomes law as drafted. Many states, including Nebraska and five bordering states, have what is called a golden rule law. Simply put, these states mirror the in-state preferences of a contractor's home state. This allows contractors to freely follow work, which results in more opportunity for contractors and savings to taxpayers. For example, Wyoming does not have a golden rule law and, and favors Wyoming contractors over Nebraskans. Our current law allows Nebraska to mirror those restrictions. By contrast, Nebraska and Iowa have golden rule laws. This allows contractors to bid work in each other's states freely. Section 39 of this bill seeks to delete Nebraska's golden rule law and replace it with an optional in-state preference. 
the problem, and I don't believe this was the intention of the bill drafters, is that if this language passes, it will trigger the golden rule law in every other state where Nebraskans do business. In other words, it will activate laws in other states by creating an explicit disadvantage for Nebraskans. For contractors, this would make it tremendously difficult to compete and grow. Because highway jobs have a geographically large footprint, most Nebraska public contractors also do business in neighboring states. Section 39 would also create the same barriers to companies that supply construction products to public owners. It's worth noting that these supply companies are very often veteran-owned businesses. Public contracting is a very common career choice for transitioning service members. As I stated, LB 461 was largely drafted to incorporate the study findings from last year's LB 1037. Section 39 does not do that. There is nothing in the study that supports replacing Nebraska's golden rule law with an in-state preference. In fact, the study specifically states on page 49 that it is not recommending such a preference. Simply put, section 39 does not belong in this important and timely bill, which we otherwise support. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm trying to mark and make notes at the same time here. Okay, uh, questions. All right, thank you for your testimony and I'll get to read as soon as things slow down today. All right, uh, next proponent testifier for LB 461. Okay, opponent to 461, neutral 461. Senator Arch, would you like to close? Thank you for your your time and attention to this matter. Um, I this is this is probably one of the larger larger exercises certainly occurred over the interim, um, and 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 it was a very thorough process. Um, I don't want to go back and rehash all of the St. Francis, I would only mention that there was one other bill that came out of that uh, of that study, and that was in addition to this issue of, of procurement, we also have issues with child welfare reform. That bill was introduced as well, uh, which required DHHS to hire a consultant as we required DAS to hire a consultant, and and they have done so. They're in the process. That 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 is underway right now of taking a look at, at child welfare reform a report due at the end of this year in December. Um, when we, when we went through the whole process and it was, it was lengthy on the LR 29 combined with the HHS committee. Um, it, what, what became apparent to me is that it, this process has to be good from beginning to end. Um, my discussions with Senator Coulterman on the appeals process focused on the end. When things go bad, what happens? And, and yet, when we saw the history of sometimes and, and previous, ex, you know, previous examples of things going bad when that, that spanned administration, spanned directors, it, it wasn't, we, we saw that there was a system issue. We needed to get upstream in that. And so a lot of the a lot of the conversations that I had with Acaso in this process was, you know, making the right decision and not trying to correct the bad decision. So much of the work that was done in this legislative bill focused on that. There was a question that just kept coming back over and over and over in our process, and that was this question of how could you possibly have have given this contract to somebody that bid. 40% below your competitor, not, not just, not just the other bidder, but also against the same cost that the state was incurring elsewhere, not in the Eastern service area, but they were managing case managing, um, these youth elsewhere in the state. And it was a very similar cost to that. It was a very similar cost to promise ship the bid. And this St. Francis came in 40% low and was awarded the bid. And, and that, that question, and I, I always described it as due diligence, that question of due diligence, can we do our due diligence in these contracts? And, and what we found was language. Language that really, I mean, words are very important, and language that prevented the state from doing that, that locked them into this lowest responsible bidder. And, and, 
and not having responsible responsiveness, resp responsible as a standalone criteria, all of these things became very apparent. So um, I feel very good that, that we have cor corrected in this language a system that supported um, that St. Francis bid. What we're doing here, I think, is, is um, a bit generational because we're building a system that supports good decision making. Sometimes in government, we allow ourselves to say, well, we've got a great director here or we've got a great executive there or, you know, governor or whatever. And, and so therefore we're good. As long as we have great people, then we're good. And it depends upon those people, but, but people come and go and we've got to have a system that supports it. And that's what I think we're doing with our procurement system here. We're actually building that system. With regards to Section 39 that was mentioned by the last testifier, we'll, we'll, we'll keep looking at that. It did, it's, it's a little confusing because if you go in there and you, and you read it, it moves to May. And, and so it gives latitude. But I understand the point that was made. And we've had those discussions outside of this hearing as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll take another look at that and, and see if there's better language. Um, we certainly don't want to disadvantage our, our in-state contractors doing business in other states. So we'll certainly take a look at that. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you might have. Well, my question was on section 39. He answered that. So that was my only question. Any questions for the speaker? Yes, Senator Hunt. There's some dots to connect here on the theme of the bills we've been hearing. And um, I would ask, do you, do you believe that this bill's really about legislative oversight? I, well, I say not directly. It, it is about the legislature's responsibility to make sure that we have processes that support good government. It's not so much it's not so much oversight as, as in investigation, because that certainly was done in, in triplicate with, with our LR29 committee. Um, but the findings of that says we need to have good systems. And, then I, and I do believe that, that the legislature is very much involved in that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any additional questions? I need to read into the record that uh, position letters we had uh, Two proponents, zero opponents, and zero in the neutral. And that will close out our hearing on LB 461. And we will reset for the next hearing. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Now, people have been uh, growing in number here. So I'm going to figure out if I'm still at five or we're going to three. Let's see how many people leave. I worry because a lot of times. The lobbyists will come in here to sleep in the afternoon. I count you, but I shouldn't. All right, so of those remaining here that are going to... Go ahead, John. Have, have a seat. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Uh, how many in here plan to speak on one of the two remaining bills before us? All right, we're going to stay with five minutes. I'm going to trust you. All right, with that, uh, we will open on LB133. John, welcome to the Government Committee. Thank you, Chairman Brewer and members of the Government Committee. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Cavanaugh, J-O-H-N-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H, and I represent Legislative District Number 9 in Midtown Omaha, historically called the Sunshine District. I'm here today to introduce the Sunshine Law, LB-133, which would include entities that have the power of eminent domain in the definition of public bodies under the Open Nebraska Open Meetings Act. The power of eminent domain is one of the most serious powers the state is invested with. The power to take the land of someone against their will should only be exercised in the most rare of circumstances, and when exercised, should be done in the sunshine. I sit on the Natural Resources Committee, and in my time in the, in, in the legislature, I've sat through many hearings over many bills dealing with entities that have the power of eminent domain. In these hearings, I was shocked to discover that there are entities invested with the power of eminent domain who are not subject to open meetings. I do not think it's right that anyone should operate in darkness while using the power of the state to take someone's property. This, is a, this bill is simple. It simply adds entities, whether private, public, or quasi-governmental, which may by law exercise the power of eminent domain to the definition of a body that is subject to the open meetings requirement. 
I'm certain that you'll hear from private businesses today that have been granted the power over the decades that this law is too burdensome and that following the Open Meetings Act would put them in a, at a competitive disadvantage. To that, I will only say that perhaps the advantage of using the state's eminent domain power is not worth it. I will confess some curiosity myself as to who will come in opposition. Since introducing LB 133, I've been surprised to learn of the many more private entities that already have the power of eminent domain. I'm willing to sit down and discuss the technical changes of this bill consistent with the intent of transparency and protecting the interest of Nebraska property owners. Eminent domain should be a rarely utilized tool for government, and we have allowed too many private actors to be granted that power with little oversight or accountability. LB 133 is a step to correct that. I thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Let's see if we have questions for you on LB 133. Senator Lowe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Kavanaugh. Um, how is eminent domain achieved? Uh, well, there's sta statute that's pretty specific on that. Essentially, somebody who has the power, I mean, a good example is, uh, you know, a city or a county, uh, would have some public good, some public need for land, they would attempt to purchase it. Uh, and if they do not achieve a, an agreement and they really do need that land, they could go through a condemnation process. Um, I, I guess I can't tell you, the folks who may come and testify against it, whether they have some specific uh, different scheme. Uh, so in the process of developing this statute, I did go to legislative research to find out who all has power of eminent domain. And uh, the list is, well, probably 15 pages long of just line after line of different entities. So there are really hundreds of different entities in the state that have eminent domain, not all of them public. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to get to here is make sure that everybody that is using the power of eminent domain is doing it in the public eye. But it's a pretty thorough process, isn't it? To go through from beginning to end, it's a, there's a lot of checkpoints going through. Well, the question is, when is the beginning? Well, I'd say the beginning. Well, now you're asking me questions. <laughs> I, rhetorically, I'll ask that question, and I'll answer it, I guess, if you like. Uh, so for a public entity, the beginning would be the discussion at the county board meeting about whether or not we should undertake such project, uh, which what area it should go in, maybe a discussion about where those different areas are, and then ultimately a, a, to the decision to move forward with public comment and input, and then the decision to try and purchase that property and make those plans. For a private entity who has the power of eminent domain, a lot of those decisions about whether even to undertake the project uh, and which area you're gonna pursue it in would be out of the, the public eye. The only part that then would be in the public eye is once you begin that condemnation process. So it's, and that's kind of the part that I think is really fundamentally important to the conversation. If you're gonna use the state's power uh, of a condemnation taking people's property, then the whole conversation about whether we should do this should be part of the public discussion. Would, would this, added language in this, would this also uh, affect their other meetings besides the one where they're looking to um, condemn property? As written, that would be my reading of it and kind of why I put in comment there about willing to work on technicalities of it. Uh, and as I stated, there are apparently a lot of people that this applies to. And first off, mm -hmm. to make a change like this, we may need to wrap, wrap our arms around who all we're talking about. And uh, hopefully we'll get a better idea of that today. And then perhaps we can have a better concept of how to tailor it in that way. Thank you. Senator Holler. Thank you, Chairman Brewer. Welcome, Senator Kavanaugh. You referred to your district as the Sunshine District, is that? Yes, sir. And I'm guessing that your district would be in favor of Senator Breezy's daylight savings time. Uh, I did vote in favor of that last time. Yes. <laughs> I I would definitely be interested in your list of those who have that authority. I had no idea it was that many people. Uh, I mean, it, some of them are giving, uh, you know, for, for roads and 
and things like that. But uh, that number just seems incredibly high to give that kind of authority to. So uh, maybe I'd be happy to share it. I've got one copy here. I can probably have copies made or I can circulate it for right. my email. No, I'd, I'd love to see that. Good. Um, all right. Other questions for Senator Kavanaugh? All right. You stick around for close? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay, we will start with proponents to LB-133. Proponents. Right. I have to do a little bit of a delay here. So I, yeah, there we go. Well, I, haven't I knew you were out there somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll do my testimony and then I'll hand it in after I We're going to trust you. Thank you. Well, actually, if you want to take and just go ahead and fill it out there real quick and then we don't break procedure here and then you okay you're green be glad to do that well i just because what will happen is julie will give me the eye okay and i'll right. know that i'm doing something wrong <laughs> and i would rather have you take a little bit of time there than me get the eye i appreciate that senator all right I believe that i you didn't have much honor... time from when you came in till we threw you in the hot seat here so yeah well i did just walk in the, the door so and I was expecting there would be other proponents, and I would not well, be the first person up. John needs all the friends he can get. <laughs> well, I'm always glad to support legislative activities. Oh, sorry. I... All right. My comments about lobbyists sleeping in my committee evidently hit somewhere because people are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> they don't realize how fascinating my testimony will be. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a factor. <laughs> but trying to bring a bit of levity on this Friday afternoon. All right, okay. there we go. Now we're going to be official. Okay. And you got handouts. Copies of my testimony. So. All right, very good. Welcome to the Government Committee. Good afternoon, Chairman Brewer and members of the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. <coughs> my name is Kenneth Winston. Um, name is spelled K-E-N-N-E-T-H W-I-N-S-T-O-N. -N. And I'm appearing on behalf of the Bold Alliance in support of LB-133. First, let me apologize for taking extra time to, to fill out the green sheet. I thought I was going to have time to, to make it here in plenty of time, but in any event. Uh, all right. Um, well, first of all, the Bold Alliance uh, is an organization that works to pre protect land, air, and water from pollution. And we also are interested in protecting fundamental American rights to own property. We work with farmers and ranchers to protect their property rights. We support the protection of private property rights guaranteed by both the United States Constitution and the Nebraska Constitution. We are strongly opposed to the use of eminent domain for a private gain. Both the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and Article 1, Section 21 of the Nebraska Constitution forbid the use of eminent domain unless it is for a public use and just compensation is provided. Further, there's a number of Nebraska statutes that, that specifically prohibit the use of eminent domain for economic development purposes. In addition, there's an uh, abundant case law that indicates that eminent domain is disfavored as a public policy and should only be used as a last resort. We support LB-133 because it would require public disclosure of the factors related to the project for which eminent domain is sought. This would provide an opportunity for public discussion of whether the proposed project or proposed activity meets the standards required by the U.S. and state constitutions, as well as the other provisions of state law that I've also cited, including the prohibition of eminent domain for economic development purposes. Uh, just want to offer a suggestion that, that we believe that uh, a narrower or a different draft of this bill could achieve the same purposes that Senator Kavanaugh is seeking to achieve. Uh, but and we would be glad to work with uh, this, the chairman and the members of the committee to uh, to create the appropriate language that would achieve this goals without 
uh, creating additional requirements for entities prior to the time that they seek to exercise eminent domain authority. With that, I'd be glad to respond to questions. All right. Well, thank you for the testimony. Let's see if we have some questions for you. Senator Lowe. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming in and testifying. Um, is Bold Alliance a, a national organization or just a Nebraska organization? It's primarily in Nebraska, uh, uh, headquartered in Hastings. Uh, Bold Nebraska, of course, is the, the most well-known uh, part of that. I'm not sure how many states Bold works in, but the Bold Alliance does work in several states. I know in Iowa and Minnesota, uh, at least. So, uh, so I don't know exactly how many states. Okay. Do you know, um, are there any other states where um, this, um, where private entities would be subject to the Open Meetings Act? Um, I'm not aware of, of that specifically, um, but I do think that there there is some good, there are good pu public policy reasons for requiring a public, a private entity to follow the public meetings laws if they are seeking to exercise them in a domain. And I think I described the reasons that way you could have a public discussion about uh, the, um, about what's being contemplated and what are the purposes being sought? Is it a public use? Uh, how are they planning? Are they planning to, will there be economic development activities involved? So those kinds of act, uh, things could be discussed at that public meeting. Isn't that kind of what the process is for eminent domain to, for the court system to go through this? At, at, the point, at the time that it goes to the courts, there's no opportunity to discuss any of that. It's basically what uh, the court will just decide whether they're going to allow the eminent domain proceeding to, to go forward or end the amount of the compensation if they do. So there really isn't. That would, that would be in county court? Uh, yes, yes, I believe it's the county But then court. it could go to district court following. Uh, I, I'm not sure of the appeal process. Okay. Uh, and because I've not personally dealt with an eminent domain case, uh, there, uh, I, I can I can find out that information if, if that's something you'd like to yes, do. please, if you would. Okay, I, I will. Or I'll maybe check. somebody behind you could. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe there. see some heads nodding back there. Okay, there may be, there may be wiser heads in the audience. <laughs> All right, uh, additional questions. All righty, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other proponents to LB 133? All right, we'll go to opponents to LB 133. And if, you, uh, if you're gonna be testifying, move forward and then I'll have a better idea how many we got. What from the government committee? Thank you, Chairman Brewer. Good afternoon. Members of the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, my name is Jill Becker, spelled J-I-L-L-B-E-C-K-E-R, and I appear before you today as a registered lobbyist on behalf of Black Hills Energy. I'm also representing today the Nebraska State Chamber, the Nebraska Telecom Association, and Northwestern Energy. As an organization, Black Hills Energy is a natural gas utility, proudly serving approximately 300,000 customers in Nebraska in over 319 communities. In total, the Black Hills Energy family serves 1.3 million natural gas and electric customers in eight states. We have literally thousands of miles of natural gas pipelines in Nebraska alone. We are opposed to LB133 today for three main reasons. First, as an organization, as a private entity, we are not structured to comply with the bill as written and with the Open Meetings Act. For example, we do not have a board or commissioners that are involved in our day-to-day -day operations. Our board of directors for our corporation live across the country and as a uh, publicly rotated utility, I have no idea but I'm going to assume that every type of action may fall within the Open Meetings Act. So this for us would be very onerous. Um, we are not structured to post our meetings, you know, uh, per statutory requirements in advance. Like we, we just really are not structured that way. Um, secondly, we're opposed because according to our reading of the bill, it applies to every and any activity 
of our organization. So even though uh, it references eminent domain, the green copy of the bill doesn't restrict the requirements of the Open Meeting Act solely to eminent domain activities. And finally, uh, I would just mention, because this bill has um, a, a submitted fiscal note, that fiscal note certainly does not apply to us. It would be tremendously costly for us to notice whatever we would have to provide for um, public notice, it would cost us very significantly. So while I appreciate the process of our fiscal notes and the entities that they ask, um, frankly, it's completely wrong if you asked us, if you would ask us in this application. So because of those reasons, we would encourage you not to advance LB 133 to the floor. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you. And yes, our fiscal notes are always a challenge to figure out. So. All right. Questions? All right. We're going to get off easy this afternoon. Great, thank you. Next testifier in opposition to LB 133. Welcome to the Government Committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Brewer and committee members. My name is James Dukesher, J-A-M-E-S-D-U-K-E-S-H-E-R-E-R. -E -E I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Nebraska Rural Electric Association. NREA is testifying today in opposition to LB-133. The, the Nebraska Rural Electric Association represents 30 rural, 34 rural public power districts and electric cooperatives throughout the state. The more than 1,000 dedicated employees of our system serve 240,000 meters across nearly 90,000 miles of line. I'm also testifying on behalf of the Nebraska Power Association, which represents all of Nebraska's 165 public power utilities. LB 133 would define any entity that can exercise eminent domain as a public body under the Open Meetings Act. The bill would not, as has been said, the bill would not be limited to only those meetings that deal with imminent domain proceedings, but would rather apply to every meeting of an entity, of an impacted entity. The NREA includes among our membership nine electric cooperatives. Three of these cooperatives are headquartered within Nebraska. Midwest Electric Cooperative Corporation and Grant, Panhandle Rural Electric Membership Association and Alliance, and Niagara Valley Electric Membership Corporation headquartered in O'Neill. Although in many aspects, these rural electric utilities operate similarly to a public power district and they, put, and they possess condemnation authority under Chapter 70, they are not public bodies. They are private, not-for-profit corporations with some key differences when compared to their public power district counterparts. Co-op member, owner, co member owners are not political subdivisions of the state. They elect their board members at an annual meeting, not on the general election ballot. Co-ops pay property taxes and they're not exempt from OSHA and DOT regulations. Our member cooperatives rarely use their condemnation authority. In fact, uh, when asked, they'd be hard pressed to, to these three co-ops would be hard pressed to find a time in the last 30 years when they've used their condemnation authority. They go out of their way to get easements signed, to use, utilize the, the, the right of way when necessary and avoid using eminent domain whenever possible. If they could pursue, if they pursued the eminent domain, the process would be similar to that of a public power district. They would first need board approval and as already stated, the board is elected from among the consumer members. Member owners can attend the board meetings. They can address the board. They can review their meeting minutes. The cooperatives would also hold meetings open to their membership to discuss the proposed project and ensuring an open and transparent project. Whether it be a public power district or an electric cooperative, transparency has been the hallmark of all public power utilities in the state for the past 75 years. It's for these reasons that we asked that LB 133 or that LB 133 unnecessarily impacts public powers, electric cooperatives, and we ask you to put, oppose the advancement of this bill. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. So let's let's go back and talk to uh, well the ones that are going to be in your Nebraska Power Association. If you want to. Take and move a power line from point A to point B, and there isn't one there right now. And um, do you have to go before like a planning and zoning board in order to get permission to move that power line across someone's land? Or, or how would you go about that so that the right people were aware of what's going on and how it's being done? All of my members um, have publicly elected boards. And they give a notice of those meetings. So the publicly elected board, whether it be a cooperative member owner or a public power district, the public would be invited to come into that meeting and have that discussion. Okay. 
But even if the people come in and said, we think this is a really bad idea, you could still run the power line, right? Because you're going to have the ability, the authority to do that. Ultimately, it'd be a board decision. Okay. And what you're saying is, if the board disregards the will of the people, then they'll pay a price when the time comes for re-election. That, and if they did have to go, and I said it's rarely used, but if they did have to use condemnation authority, as was stated earlier, there's a court process available to that. You have to prove public use, and, and they may not do that. I am familiar with a case where um, the railroad tried to move a rail line in western Nebraska, and the court uh, wouldn't allow them to do it. said it was not a public use uh, to add an additional line for efficiency purposes. That didn't meet the requirement for public use. Well, I think it was uh, Custer Public Power had got a hold of me. But they were they were using the same right of way, but they were going to a you know a whatever when you up upgrade to a bigger better line, uh, but it didn't seem like an issue because you're using the same right of way. The only thing you were changing was the amount of power you could move from A to B, which didn't seem like that big a deal. I just didn't know if you actually were going to take a different route. What kind of authority there? But uh, it goes essentially to the board after there's hearings, and then the decision is made. And you guys go ahead and, and back that up before they would use them in the domain, they would they would get easements, which would mean they would have to reach out to landowners to get that easement. It's only under circumstances where they weren't given an easement that they would have to go use condemnation authority. OK. All right. Questions. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome to the government committee. Good afternoon, Chairman Brewer, members of the government, military and veterans affairs committee. I won't quite do a Senator Howland ditto, even though you might like to hear it, but I'll be echoing a lot of what you just heard. Uh, my name is Adam Fieser, A-D-A-M-F-E-S-E-R. I'm the director of cooperative advancement for the Nebraska Cooperative Council. We represent the interests of agricultural, rural, electric and telephone cooperatives in our great state. Uh, our membership includes three rural electric cooperatives, two telephone cooperatives. They're private member-owned corporations. They're Democratic entities governed by boards, elected by their members with bylaws approved by the members. Membership in cooperatives is open and voluntary to all use services. And Nebraskans getting power telecommunications through these cooperatives are member owners and have an equal vote in how it's governed. If LB 133 were enacted, rural electric and telephone cooperatives would be subject to the Open Meetings Act. I reached out to our members that would be affected by this legislation, and none of them can remember even utilizing eminent domain. I spoke to a lot of them. I'm sure maybe at some point in time it's happened, but they couldn't remember it if it has happened, which seems like a lot of overreach to say all their meetings should be subject to Open Meetings Act if they can't even remember the last time they've used the eminent domain. That is the reason for the bill. Um, so they have in place bylaws that determine how their meetings are announced and conducted. 133 would necessitate the rewriting of their bylaws and place undue burden on uh, the undue burden of complying with the entirety of the Open Meetings Act with the threat of criminal sanctions for violating it. And I was going to print out the outline, just the outline from uh, Attorney General Hilder's website, and the outline alone was 43 full pages. <laughs> so it's obviously a lot to figure out how do we do this. I would guess there'd be legal counsel involved, the cost of that, and then your leadership and administrators having to figure out, okay, how do we comply with this so we aren't you know, charged with a misdemeanor that if we don't follow it, whatever we do in the meeting might not be valid. Um, it seems like a whole heck of a lot of work when, especially in our case, it's not even achieving the goal of you know, open government, open public entities, which uh, seems to be the actual goal. So. Um, with that, we urge, we for those reasons, we urge you to urge the committee to not send 133 to the floor of the legislature. And if you have questions, I'll try my best to answer them. All right, Adam, let's see if we have any questions. Questions? Questions. All right. So, you know, thanks for your testimony. Okay. Next opponent to LB 133. Is there anyone here in the neutral? All right. Senator Kavanaugh, would you like to come and close on LB-133? I would love to. Thank you, Chairman Brewer and members of the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. Appreciate your attention on a Friday afternoon. Um, just kind of wanted to point out a few things. I do. I appreciate everybody coming to testify on both sides today. I appreciate the comments. I would certainly suggest you take a look at the comments on that are both opposed and in favor of this bill. Uh, 
because I think that they, everybody here kind of, this is not necessarily an adversarial bill. I think everybody kind of has a similar perspective about eminent domain is a serious thing, should be taken seriously when we do it. Um, but the things I wanted to point out, and one thing, Senator Lowe, I forgot, I should have told you is, when somebody implements, gets to the point of eminent domain, you get to a point you can't have an agreement, even before you go to court, the condemner is allowed to go on somebody's property to make assessments and look at easements and things like that, and they're not allowed to be turned away, even if before they've been granted the, the eminent domain. So there is, even if you go to court and lose in, in condemnation, you still get to go on people's property and look around, which I think we should be very serious about. Um, but in my kind of, this bill was a learning experience for me. I, I came to bring this bill because of something I discovered uh, and started looking. And so in the process of reading uh, about this in preparation, I noticed the Nebraska Constitution has specific references to eminent domain, including, uh, I brought my nice constitution that they give us here, the updated one uh, with the change from the last ballot initiative and under Let's see, section, it would be Article 10, uh, Section 8, says no railroad corporation organized under the laws of any other state or of the United States and doing business in the state shall be entitled to exercise the right of eminent domain or have the power to acquire the right of way or real estate for depot or other uses until it shall have become a body corporate pursuant to and in accordance with the laws of the state of Nebraska. And then there are two or three Supreme Court cases on point basically just finding out discerning what means a body corporate in the state of Nebraska. But essentially what it means is that if you want the power of eminent domain as a railroad in the state of Nebraska, you have to incorporate here and subject yourself to the laws of the state of Nebraska. And what that means is eminent domain is such an important power that we want to make sure you're here and we can get a hold of you, right? And so the theme I heard from folks today, and I think it's a fair one, is that this bill would be overly cumbersome for them. But what I also heard was that they don't use eminent domain. They can't remember the last time they used it. And so I am not married to the idea of the fact that they have to be open to subject oh, to public meetings. I don't particularly think that all of these organizations do need to be open to public meetings. However, I think that they maybe don't need the power of eminent domain. And so what I'm hearing here is all of these entities that came and opposed my bill don't think that they need eminent domain uh, so much that they would subject themselves to uh, regulation. And so I think you can do one of two things. You can say you can have the power of eminent domain, but you have to do it in public, or you don't need the power of eminent domain. They don't use it enough to justify subjecting themselves to this regulation, then don't do it. The railroads, starting back in the 1800s, if they wanted eminent domain in Nebraska, they had to subject themselves to the laws of the state of Nebraska. I'm saying the same thing today. You don't have to have eminent domain or you don't have to subject yourself to this law, but if you do want eminent domain, then you have to give us a little bit more. You have to be a little bit more open to the public. And that's all I'm saying here. You can pick pick your poison, one or the other. All right. Questions for Senator Kavanaugh? Uh, Senator Lowe. Thank you. Um, do you know of any other states that subject private businesses to uh, the Open Meetings Act? I don't, uh, the Open Meetings Act, you know, it's very, it's relatively new. So the Open Meetings Act in Nebraska is 1975. Um, and so uh, I don't know that. I do know states that are starting to pull back on uh, power of eminent domain, including our neighbor to the east, Iowa. I just heard on the radio this morning has a bill about pulling back power of eminent domain for some of these entities that came and testified today. And so that, and that may be their, their approach. Honestly, it just didn't even occur to me until today. <laughs> All right. Other questions? All right, we need to read into the record here before we let you go. On LBU 133, we had five proponents, three opponents, zero in the neutral. We got one proposed on 133. What do we got next? Oh, me. Okay, I'm out. Here, hand that over to the vice. Thank you. How many of those do you have? I didn't want to start. <laughs> I don't have a bag for weapons, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I know where he's next. You don't want to mooch from me. The floor is all yours, Senator. <clears throat> all right, one more time. We're going to try and 
save the voice here. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Sanders, and good afternoon, fellow members of the Government Committee. I'm Senator Tom Brewer, for the record, that is T-O-M-B-R-E-W-E-R. -E -E I represent 11 counties, the 43rd Legislative District of Western Nebraska, and I'm here to introduce LB513. This bill was brought to me by the request of the League of Nebraska Municipalities. Um, the bill makes two changes. One, the bill allows uh, local government to meet notice requirements under the Open Meetings Act when a newspaper fails to notice, fails to get notice out in a timely fashion. The bill uh, does not eliminate the newspaper notice or any other public notice requirement. The notice will still go in, in the paper and go onto the newspaper website and be published in the Press Association State website. This bill just prevents the public body from having to totally reset on the public hearing if the newspaper misses a deadline. Two, the bill will go will also change the list of public bodies that can use uh, video conferencing more than half of the time. In recent years, the legislature has had a few changes to how our public bodies use technology for public meetings. The last update was when Senator Flood brought us LB 83 in 2001 or 2001, 2021. This bill uh, expands on that progress. I believe I'll be followed by representatives from the league that will probably answer your technical questions. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Senator Brewer? I'm between you and going home. You're closing though, right? Do I'll you be stick around? Welcome to the Government Committee. Thank you very much. Sarah Sanders, members, members of the committee, my name is Lynn Rex, L-Y-N-N-R-E-X, representing the League of Nebraska Municipalities. <coughs> First, we really want to thank Senator Brewer for introducing this very important bill. We also want to thank Dennis DeRossett of the Nebraska Press Association and also Media of Nebraska for negotiating with us. This is the result of a negotiated agreement. Uh, it was with the League of Nebraska Municipalities, the Nebraska Association of County Officials, the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts, and also the Nebraska Community College Association. So with that, I'd appreciate uh, you just opening up your bill. I'm going to walk you through this. Um, it's a great bill and one, again, that will modernize the act again. And we really appreciate, again, the Nebraska Press Association for having the vision to move forward on some of these very important concepts. On page two, you'll note that 25-1274 is being amended. And again, this is the vision of Dennis Ross of the Nebraska Press Association to basically update and modernize how you give legal notice, proof of publication. So you'll know we're inserting the words, not just in a newspaper, but inserting or on a statewide website established and maintained as a repository of public notices by a majority of Nebraska newspapers, translation, MPA website. So we really appreciate that update. Very quickly, I'll just walk through some of this for you. Um, section two of the bill is just harmonizing for SID, standing for improvement districts. Section three, just harmonizing for the Nebraska Investment Financing Authority. Section four, Harmonizing provisions for the Nebraska Educational Health, Cultural, and Social Services Finance Authority. Section 5, updating and harmonizing for the ESUs. So we then go to page 4, and this is where the bill becomes, I think, substantive, in the sense that on page 4, section 6, line 7, and th these are amendments to Section 84, 1411 of the Open Meetings Act in the state of Nebraska. Since this bill does have the E clause, which is very important to us, these provisions that I'm going to talk to you about will take effect immediately upon the governor's signature. That's assuming, and we appreciate you advancing this bill to the floor and, of course, it passing this year. On line nine, until January 1, 2024, and why that date? The Nebraska Press Association has indicated to us that they need at least basically a year uh, to kind of get some things uh, finalized with their website. So until that time, so until January 1, 2024, basically the same types of provisions are in effect with one exception. And just as a quick overview, because this is current law, if you look on lines basically 9 through 18, this governs what's reasonable advanced publicized notice. 
And it's important to note that we also have in lines 14 to 18, uh, basically dealing with governing bodies except second class cities and villages. The, let me rephr rephrase that, governing bodies of political subdivisions, uh, because it's a little bit different for everyone else. Lines 19 through 27, this is all current law. This is what applies if you're a city of the second class or village. And one of the big exceptions there is on lines 25 and 27. In current law, they can post in three public places. Then on lines 28 to 30, this is for all public bodies that are not political subdivisions. And we'll talk about some of those later today. So starting on line 31 on page four, this is what is important and why we need the E-clause because of issues that have occurred here. And again, it's not just refusal or neglect necessarily, but we thought those were the important words. Sometimes it's just the inability of the newspaper to make the publication. So on page four, line 31, in case of refusal, neglect, or inability of the newspaper to timely publish the notice, going on to page five, line one, the public body shall do the following things. A, post such notice on its own website, if it's available. B, post such notice in a conspicuous public place in the public body's jurisdiction. And then, of course, have a written notice, written record of the posting. And the record of that posting shall be evidence that the posting was done as required and sufficient to meet the requirement of publication. Because of time, we've kind of divided out some responsibilities of what those following me will testify about. Uh, John Spots, Executive Director of the Nebraska Association of School Boards, can give you some specific examples of why this is important and why it needs to pass with the E-Clause because of things that have occurred there. So in any event, um, moving on throughout the rest of this bill, on page 5, line 26, this is what happens beginning January 1, 2024, when this bill passes. By that time, the Nebraska Press Association's website will be up. And if I may have maybe a question or be allowed to continue through this, I'd appreciate it. I'll allow it. Thank, Thank you. you. You can you can slow down a little bit. I think we've got this. Okay. I just did I just didn't know. This yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So on page five, line uh, 26. Now we've gone through a year where there are provisions here, but by this time, then the Nebraska Press Association will have its platform up so that it gives other options here. And again, we really appreciate the fact that they've gone the extra mile to modernize and tie into where we are in terms of technology now. Page five, line 26, beginning January 1, 2024. This is, again, if you look at lines 27 to 30, that's really the same language that you have above. There's a lot of repeat in terms of drafting of this. Uh, it was decided to basically just repeat the whole thing again. So this is the same that you have on 84-1411-1A. Uh, same thing, how you give reasonable advance publicized notice. Uh, going on to the next page. This governs looking on lines 4 through 17. This is how governing bodies of all political subdivisions and their advisory committees accept second class cities and villages. This is how they give notice and would be giving notice and what their options are for doing so. And again, governing bodies of all political subdivisions and their advisory committees, but not second class cities or villages. We're not talking about state entities or anybody else. So line four, Publication in a newspaper of general circulation within the public body's jurisdiction, and this is critical language, critically important, that is finalized for printing prior to the time and date of the meeting. And as John Spots will note, there are times when we've had this with cities too, when you have to have a special meeting, but maybe you only have a weekly paper. So that's the kind of concept that we're talking about here. Secondly, posting on such newspaper's website, if available, and posting on a statewide website, in other words, the MPA's website, established and maintained by MPA. And note that the notice will be placed in the newspaper and on the websites by the newspaper. The other option on line 11, lines 11 through 17. And again, this is for governing bodies of all political subdivisions and their advisory committees, except for second class cities and villages. Posting to the newspaper's website, if available, a statewide website, again, always referencing that is MPA. And then this occurs if there's no addition of a newspaper of general circulation within the public body's jurisdiction finalized for printing. So what you have in lines four, basically through 10, is what happens when basically you can meet the, the deadline for printing. Uh, 
What happens in lines 11 through 17 is if there is no addition of a newspaper of general circulation within the public body's jurisdiction that's finalized to printing prior to the time and date of the meeting. And these are things that have occurred with all of our political subdivisions from time to time. It does happen. It's not typical, but it does happen. And then what occurs when that happens? Posting to the newspaper's website and uh, posting to the statewide website, which is the MPA platform. Going on to lines 18 through 31 on page 6, this applies to second-class cities and villages and their advisory committees. And essentially, it's the same thing that you had up above in their A and B. So for second-class cities and their advisory committees, same thing that we've talked about above. However, they have another option, which we have retained here on page 7, lines 4 through 6. So in other words, everything that applies to the other political subdivisions except second-class cities and villages applies to second-class cities and villages here. However, they also have the ability to post written notice in three conspicuous places. Such notice shall be posted by the public body in the same three places for each meeting. And by the way, that's typical. That's what almost all of our second-class cities and villages do. But in addition, they're going to have other options there. And then you'll note line 7 to 9. This is on page 7 line seven to nine. This is for the other public bodies that are not political subdivisions. The Board of Regents, for example, um, NRDs, those uh, sorts of folks. Uh, well, actually, that's not them because they are a political subdivision. So basically, it would be those types of entities which risk management associations and others as well. Lines 10 through 18. So page seven, lines 10 through 18. This is really important. Again, the language of in case of refusal or neglect of the newspaper to publish the notice. And I want to underscore here, we don't have, we're not here to report that, oh my gosh, the newspapers are not being collaborative. They're not being cooperative. It's just sometimes they can't do it. It just comes down to that. Then what happens? The public body shall A, post notice on its website if they have one. B, submit a post on MPA's website, which is, means the statewide website. And C, post in a conspicuous public place. Again, keeping a written record. That's evidence that such posting was done and sufficient to fulfill the requirements of publication. So this is really important because it's intended to address some scenarios that those that follow me can talk about. Starting on line 19, page 7, line 19. Again, we're still amending just the one statute, 84-1411. This deals with virtual conferencing. You'll note that there are no changes to this on, on page 7. But you'll note who's in this, who's in the list, starting on line 22. These are regional or state entities. And right now, the general rule is regional or state entities, they cannot have more than half of their meetings virtually, meaning video conference, telephone conference, that sort of thing, or Zoom, if you will. So basically, that list doesn't change. Going on to page 8, I'll just underscore Again, what we appreciated this committee doing with LB83 in 2021, lines 7 through 10 actually have the newest members of these. These are statewide, they're regional entities. Then what you also have here is how they go about what do you have to do to hold a meeting virtually. So lines starting with line 11, no changes here, but this is how you have a virtual meeting. So there's no changes there. Just want to let you know those requirements are still in place. Going to page 9. Uh, starting on line two. Again, the general rule on page nine, line two. No more than one half of the meetings of the state entities, advisory committees, boards, councils, and they mean statewide regional boards and councils. Organizations or governing bodies are held by virtual uh, conferencing in a calendar year. In other words, you can't have more than half of your meetings that way. So the Board of Regents cannot have more than half of their meetings that way as an example. But there are some exceptions that have been longstanding. You'll note the lines that are being deleted on lines 14 through 18 on page 9. Those apply. The deleted language applies to risk management agencies. That would be like the League Association of Risk Management, uh, the Nebraska uh, Intergovernmental Risk Management Association, NERMA, ran by uh, the counties, <coughs> ALICAP ran by the school boards association. So basically what the rule has been for risk management agencies is that you can have unlimited virtual meetings if you have at least one meeting in person every calendar quarter. We're deleting that 
and putting them up in the category, along with a couple others we'll discuss here, to make it clear you have to have at least one, one meeting in person annually. Why would that be? Because sometimes it is very, very difficult, and we're having this difficulty, others are as well, in recruiting folks, frankly, west of Grand Island, to participate on these very important uh, statewide boards and commissions uh, when, in fact, maybe you only need them for 15 or 20 minutes, but to drive in is problematic. And so the point here is to address that issue. We've also included language here dealing with, I'll reference this, on lines 9 through 11, or, this is D, any advisory committee of any state entity created in response to the Opioid Prevention and Treatment Act. There are roughly 26 or 27 members that were put together in an opioid advisory task force, if you will, advisory committee, uh, requested by the Attorney General's office. A bit, there was an act that, act that passed in terms of how the state of Nebraska will be distributing opioid funds from the settlements, which our attorney general's office has done a, really a phenomenal job here in terms of representing cities and counties across the state uh, in terms of what, uh, what occurs to get the settlements. You've been reading about them periodically, 40 million with Walmart settled, you know, another umpteen million from various pharmaceuticals, Purdue and others. So this is the committee that's deciding how to do that. And it has been very difficult to get folks from all six behavioral districts, from all the different areas to come in for these various meetings. And so they too would be under the requirement that they'd have to have at least one meeting annually in person, the rest could be virtual. So we think that's extremely important. Also, you'll note on line six, we're striking the words at wholesale on a multi-state basis so that it's basically an organization created under the Municipal Cooperative Financing Act. And this provision of at least one meeting annually, uh, this has already been in the, in the law on lines five and six, an organization created under the Interlocal Cooperation Act that sells electricity or natural gas. So essentially, we think this is very, very important to have participation across the state of Nebraska. And, you know, I think that with the technology certainly in, embodies that. Folks now, the, I, if there's any silver lining to COVID, I hate to say that there's any silver lining to COVID, but if there is, it's the ability of Nebraskans, I put myself in the top of that list, to finally know how to do Zoom and do those <laughs> kinds of important processes. So again, I know that there are others that will be testifying behind me that will give you real examples of why these kinds of provisions are necessary, but I'm happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Senator Lowe? That's a lot of information. I know. <laughs> um, thank you, Ms. Rex, for being here. And going back to one of the last bills we just had, how does a virtual meeting, how do they do the Open Meetings Act with that? that okay, with the virtual meeting. People can join in and, and with, with the meeting. I mean, if, if you don't get the link to the meeting. And... Okay, are you are you asking what? Yeah, how does I'm one go about asking, having a virtual meeting? I'm just asking on a whole because I thought you may know about. I do. Uh, yes. Virtual meetings and how how does the public join in on a, okay. on a virtual meeting? Okay, so for example, great question. If you turn to page eight, these are the requirements for having, I thought you were gonna ask me the technology in terms of how those platforms are put together, which I would have to say, I do not know. I would <laughs> so, never do that too. I'm so sorry. Uh, so page eight, uh, starting on line 11, the requirements for holding a meeting by virtual conferencing are as follows. And these are very tightly followed. And I think the public too is getting to understand better how to do this. So you'll note that in line 15, there's a link to the virtual meeting. So when you give notice uh, to the public, you're giving notice to the members of the governing body, you're giving notice to the public and to the press that's requested it. And in that notice, which has to include the agenda, you also put a link. So here's the link. And frankly, you can send it out electronically. So they just press the link and then they can participate if you're a member of the public. And by participate, as we know, uh, that when you're dealing with the Open Meetings Act, not everyone is allowed to participate as a citizen, for example, at all meetings in terms of speak, but they can't be precluded from doing that at all meetings, right? So it's really important that the public be able to, and, and the media, be able to participate. But when you're dealing with virtual conferencing, uh, unless it is a, for example, that's why with, I'll take the League Association of Risk Management, why it'd be important so that our member from Scotts Bluff or from Garing, that they could actually, by Zoom then, if you're a member of the public body, 
by Zoom that's been properly noticed, Senator, then they can vote. They can be counted as part of the quorum. If it is not noticed as a virtual meeting, then they simply can't do that. It's an in-person meeting. Uh, they can join by Zoom, but they're only joining as a citizen, if you will. So they're not going to be counted as part of the quorum and they're not going to participate. But let's look at some of the other requirements. Uh, on line 16, in addition to the public's right to participate by virtual conferencing, you have to have reasonable, line 17, reasonable arrangements are made to accommodate the public's right to attend at a physical site. Um, you have to have reasonable seating, at least one designated site in the buildings open to the public and identified. So for example, when LARM, which I'm most familiar with, our League Association of Management, when it has its meetings, that means that it has a meeting. For example, we'll pick one of our members. Uh, let's say it is, um, oh gosh, uh, Oshkosh, Nebraska, or Ansley, Nebraska, and they will have the Open Meetings Act. They will have a room open. Folks will be welcome to come in. Cit you know, citizens can come in and listen and participate. They're welcome to do that. Uh, you'll note that you have a recording of the hearing by audio or whatever. You've got, and you've got at least one member of that entity that's holding the meeting or her, his or her designee present. So it's not just that they're going into an, you know, a meeting that no one's there. We think that's really important. And of course, line 23, a reasonable opportunity for input, such as public comment or questions, is provided at least to the same extent as if virtual conferencing was not used, meaning that there may be a time, and there, this has happened, so again with the League Association of Management, where it's simply a briefing by a consultant. In other words, here are the new laws governing loss control. It's just a briefing. There really is no, but it's still subject to the Open Meetings Act, but you're not going to allow public participation to basically have people comment, whereas Maybe the next time that they have that meeting, the public will be able and certainly will be able to comment on what they think of those loss control rules. I don't know if that makes sense or not. So these are very tight requirements. Uh, line 26, at least one copy of all documents being considered at that meeting, a virtual meeting is going to be available at that site. So if I show up in Ansley, Nebraska, um, they will have posted the Open Meetings Act. They will have a copy of all the materials that, that, uh, that the League Association of Management will, will be considering. And this is true for anybody doing these types of virtual meetings. So I think that that is really important. And then line 28, the public shall also provide links to an electronic copy of the agenda, all documents being considered at the meeting, and the current version of the Open Meetings Act. So that's all done virtually. So it's there's a lot of information that goes forward, and there's a lot of detail that goes into making sure that you're comporting with the Open Meetings Act so that you can have a virtual meeting that fits all of these requirements. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you get all that, Senator Lowe? <laughs> I hope that was responsive. I'm sorry if it wasn't. I, I, I thought your intro was long. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm so that's sorry. Okay. That's okay. It actually was, I'm it, sure. It, it's, it's good information. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions? See none. Thank you for your Thank testimony. you very much. And again, thanks to Senator Brewer and this committee. Thank, Thank you. you for all the information. Are there others? Proponent? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Senator you. Sanders and members of the committee. My name is John Spots, J-O-H-N-S-P-A-T-Z. It is pronounced Spots, believe it or not. I'm the executive director for the Nebraska Association of School Boards, and I want to echo Lynn Rex's appreciation from Senator Brewer and our partners in the Press Association, Dennis Dross, and I think all of our constituents uh, win when we have this type of collaboration between schools and cities and counties and our, and our partners in the media, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, Lynn Rex gave a great detailed explanation as to what the bill does. I'm going to give a couple of real world, world examples as to how this may apply. So for years and years, we've been using the standard of reasonable advanced publicized notice. And there's been a little bit of case law out there to, to explain what that is. But our attorney general's office has been a great partner over the years and disposition letters and working out how do we provide notice in a way that we're complying by the law and making sure that our constituents know when we're having meetings. And then in 2020, there was an additional requirement that it be published in a local newspaper and that hadn't been there before. That wasn't a problem for the vast majority of the meetings, but two things arose as a result of that. Um, one, uh, and I'm just going to give an example for a school board, if they're meeting on a Monday night and they're identifying candidates who interviewed for a superintendent position, um, they want to schedule interviews maybe on Thursday or Friday after they selected those members, but the, the weekly local newspaper only comes out on a Tuesday. So 
this would happen periodically where we have a mo- meeting on Monday night, but we couldn't schedule a special meeting for over a week because when the local newspaper came out. So this bill addresses that. Uh, another issue, I've, I've gotten a few calls by nervous superintendents on a Monday, a Monday of a school board meeting where they said we submitted it to the newspaper, but it didn't get published. It wasn't in the newspaper. And the question is, can we have our meeting tonight? And unfortunately, the answer was no. And we have uh, a few schools out there that have their meetings on the third Monday of the month. And state law says you shall meet. Uh, once a month by the third Monday of the month. So we were in a tight spot there. Do you have a meeting that wasn't published uh, or do you put the meeting off and and violate state law there? So uh, in collaboration with our partners in the media and the cities and the counties and other political subdivisions, language addresses those two issues. And then real quickly uh, regarding our risk pool, alley cap, uh, this, is, this is beneficial to them as well. We meet three times in person, and I don't anticipate that changing in the near future. And we also have a membership meeting in conjunction with our state conference in Omaha. And I'm always very pleasantly surprised how many people show up for an insurance membership meeting uh, for school board members. But just as an example, on our insurance pool board, we have a board member from Shadron, board member from Scotts Bluff, and a school board member from Dundee County. And and unfortunately, we pay them as much to serve on our alley cap board as they get on their local school board. We don't pay them anything. So it's a tremendous sacrifice to serve on a school board. And I'm very grateful that we have so many good people that do that. But it's a, it's an additional sacrifice when I go to them and say, can you serve on this insurance pool board? Because they have a lot of stake there financially and, and developing a good system. So this is another tool for our alley cap risk pool to be able to meet virtually if they decide to do that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Thank yep. you so Thank you for your time on a Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Government Committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Sanders and members of the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. For the record, my name is Elaine Menzel, E-L-A-I-N-E, M-E-N-Z-E-L, here today on behalf of the Nebraska Association of County Officials. I, too, would like to express support to Senator Brewer and to the partners that we've had for developing this legislation. I wasn't the one that was primarily involved in the discussions from our association. Rather, that was my executive director. However, he's unable to be here today. Um, I won't take your time. I will try to adhere to the five minutes that Senator Brewer said at the beginning of the session, but essentially just say thank you again to everyone. And we view 513 as a reasonable um, effort and we appreciate the um, partnership with the press association to move forward with these alternatives that have been proposed. So please favorably consider that and move the legislation to general file. With that, if there's any questions, I will attempt to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions? See none. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Good afternoon. Welcome to the government committee. Thank you. I will try to be an overachiever and get done in uh, less, substantially less than five minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Spady. That's R-O-B-I-N-S-P-A-D-Y. I am the Director of Legislative Affairs and the Council for Natural Gas for the Nebraska Municipal Power Pool. I am a registered lobbyist. I am here to testify in support of LD 513 on behalf of NMPP and the other NPA, the Nebraska Power Association. NMPP includes the Public Alliance for Community Energy, ACE, a retail choice natural gas supplier, the Municipal Energy Agency of Nebraska, MEAN, a wholesale electric supplier, and the National Public Gas Agency, NPGA, a wholesale natural gas supplier. The other NPA, the Nebraska Power Association, is a voluntary organization representing all segments of Nebraska's power industry, municipalities, public power districts, public power and irrigation districts, and cooperatives engaged in generation, (coughs) transmission, or distribution of electricity within our states. 
NMPP and the NPA are in favor of LB 513 and how it will make it easier to post notification of public meetings in a press sponsored website. Thank you, Lynn, for all the detail that you went through. I won't go through that as well. Uh, specifically, I am here to testify today on behalf of ACE, our retail natural gas supplier. Um, LB 513, um, if you look on page nine, line six and seven would remove the language, quote, at wholesale on a multi-state basis or, end quote. The impact of this change would be that it would allow ACE and Interlocal to have its virtual meetings as long as it has one in-person meeting during the calendar year. This change is very limited in applicability and ACE is currently unaware of any other entity in the state that the change would apply to. Uh, the result would allow ACE to conduct its meetings in the same manner of other NMPP entities like MEAN and NPGA. ACE was formed um, under the Interlocal Corporation Act in 1998 by a group of Nebraska communities, and our membership now is 75 strong. Uh, ACE is proud of its unique um, board uh, governance, where it's one person, one vote. So we have uh, actually 70, uh, 75 or 76 voting members. So in order to get um, all of them who are very geographically dispersed in one area um, to vote on issues such as our budget and rates is very difficult. We especially run into that issue at our January annual meeting that sets budget. Um, this past January, we had to scramble around a little bit uh, given some of the weather difficulties that we had. Um, so for these reasons, ACE supports LB 513. Um, it gives us more flexibility to act in manners um, in line with some of our other entities, and uh, we would ask that you advance this bill. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Okay, see none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Welcome to oh. the government committee. Senator Sanders and the members of the government committee. My name's Dean Edson, D-E-A-M-E-D-S-O-N. I'm the executive director for the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts, testifying in, in support of 513 on their behalf. Again, I'd like to reiterate, I'd like to thank the group who worked on this in the interim, especially the Press Association. I want to emphasize we strongly support using the websites for additional posting of upcoming meetings. All 23 of our districts have websites. They utilize them to post a meeting, but they also put the minutes up on the websites so to try to encourage more public involvement. Um, by developing the state website system, that'll help get information out to the public for future meeting notices. Um, one thing that's key for us in the bill uh, is the requirement for local newspapers and the press association to work together so we only have one contact person to get those meeting notices to. So if they can get, we can get it to the local press, local media source, and they can also copy it over to the state website for that contact that would save a lot of steps. Um, so I want to talk about a couple problems we run into the past couple of years. One's primarily the loss of the local newspapers. Um, to run notices, and this is a problem for rural areas. And the example I'm gonna give you is my hometown newspaper, the Gothenburg Times. There's a paper that's been in operation for over 100 years. I was a fourth generation subscriber to, to the paper. One day last spring, they announced on one day, we're ceasing operations, closed down shop today. No more future papers going out, websites down. Okay, so you have political subdivisions that had run their ads to that paper to be posted for an upcoming meeting the next week. Now they're in violation of the Open Meetings Act if they go ahead and have that meeting. So they had to cancel their meeting, find another medium source to post on, and then hold the meeting into the future. <clears throat> but I see this as being a, a, a potential problem in, in the future. And here's why, is that the readership of hard copy newspapers is going down. I'm still part of the older generation. I read four newspapers a, a day. Um, it's a bad, it's a habit of mine. I got employees. You couldn't get them to pick up that newspaper. They will not do it. They get their news 
from other sources. Um, they're not going to read a newspaper. I, I can see that as adding to the problems for these local little small town papers. And if they're not going to have a readership on a hard copy, they're not going to have their sales. It's going to be a problem. I'm going to give you another example of of some costs um, with doing these ads. Uh, recently, the lower loop NRD had a proposed rule change to their water quality regulations. They cover 16 counties, all are part of 16 counties. It cost them over $30,000 to public notice those meetings uh, with the local newspapers. So, so when you think about this, that this is all free, it's not. It's, it's expensive to do. Well, the complaint they got from a lot of the farmers that attended is that we should have been putting those notices out on Twitter because they don't read the paper. And so we're getting, you know, that's that's the point of this whole thing is it's just all going toward electronic social media, especially with the younger generation. We got to figure out a way to get it to them. So with that, I'll close and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? See none. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. Are there other proponents? Welcome to the government committee. Welcome, Senator Sanders and, and the members of the committee. Uh, I'm Kevin Edwards, K E V I N E D W A R S, A D A R D S. And uh, I represent the Pavilion Rural Fire District and the Millard Suburban Fire District. Uh, this bill gives us a lot of opportunity to uh, meet the Open Meetings Act when we have difficulties. For example, in the recent past, I had a Papillion Times uh, that I submitted the paper, the, the notice, and they simply didn't get it or didn't recognize that they got it. And uh, so they didn't post, so we didn't have our meeting. We're not a real big deal, but we just moved it to another time and posted for that. But it would have been handy to be able to use the alternative methods to uh, post the meeting and go ahead and have the meeting. Um, with that, I close and take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? See none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Are there other proponents? Opponents? Neutral? No one neutral. Welcome to the government committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Sanders, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dennis DeRossett, D-E-N-N-I-S, D-E-R-O-S-S-E-T-T. -T. I am the executive director of the Nebraska Press Association, and I'm here today to testify in the neutral capacity to LB 513. It is true that we participated in developing the language for this bill, and we appreciate the uh, municipal league and the school districts reaching out to us. And we just felt it was better to represent our position to further explain some of the detail behind the language and the intent and purpose of modernizing public notice through the statewide website uh, through this neutral position. Uh, first, a background. We've been around a long time. This is our 150th anniversary this year, one of the oldest association. We've been around for decades. We represent all newspapers across Nebraska, and we've steadfastly advocated for transparency in government throughout the entire history of our association. We advocate for the public's access and the right to know the full workings of how their tax dollars are being spent. And there's four key components that you've heard me say many times to transparency, open records, open meetings, FOIA, and public notices. The key to public notices, it must be through an independent third party. And uh, I just have to say, I don't think, it's got to be a trusted third party. Uh, the sections of LB 513 involving public notice reflect good faith negotiations and compromise. And we thank the proponent groups for reaching out and engaging in that discussion. 
for those sections of the bill unrelated to the public notice, we don't, we're not taking a position. The language we provided, and that is included in this bill pertaining to changes in section 84-1411 was offered to deal with a singular item of meeting notices of the public bodies and even further in those instances where there was an error or failure on the publication process of that notice that could impede the work of the public body. As we understand the need for these changes to be, this section is to accommodate the schedules for major non-routine business items such as interviews of superintendents or timely decisions with business or construction projects. For anything beyond the non-routine, uh, that needs to be accommodated for, the traditional time requirement for meeting notices should continue to work with the traditional publication schedules of newspapers. It's worked well for decades and would continue to do so. If for some reason the pieces don't come together and the notice doesn't get properly published, in the past year, I think there's been 140,000 public notices uploaded to the statewide website. And we've been notified, notified of about 10 to 12 notices that were not properly published. And we followed up on each of those. If we know there's an issue, we contact the publisher. Uh, but it is not a common thing. Uh, in fact, state statute actually has a solution. While we prefer the notice to be in the local newspaper, the nearest daily is already an option used, even used by some government bodies as the backup for notice because it just requires publication in a newspaper of general circulation. So we launched a statewide website in June of 2021 to help modernize public notice because that has been the call and request for years of government entities uh, and our own industry. And as of last October, this body instituted a bill that made it mandatory for newspapers to upload all notices to our statewide public notice website after they appear in print. And that's the basis for the legal basis of a notice that it must first appear in print. Currently, since we started the website January 1st of 2021, there's 240,000 notices on this website, fully searchable, no cost to government, no cost to government, I'd like to add. And all this is created uh, by the newspapers. With regard to placement on our websites, our intent with language um, is, is for those meeting notices uh, not published due to neglect or error to still be given to the newspaper so that they can appear on the newspaper's website if available and then for the newspaper to upload it to the statewide website. Newspapers are the critical independent third party and only they can upload to the statewide website because they are the only ones that confirm that it has been published. So our intent with our language in 513 and with this testimony is to still steadfastly advocate for transparency, but also show our good faith intent now and in the future to work with elected officials and the public bodies to find solutions to real problems because this is a public business and we are that critical independent third party. So with that, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Just got right in time. Very good. <laughs> thank you so. for your testimony. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other in neutral testimony? I see none. We'll go to closing. Senator Brewer. We also have position comments. We have four proponents, zero opponents, and zero neutral. <clears throat> okay, let me recap Lynn's testimony. Uh, I have no issues. I'll take any questions. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. I see none. Thank you. This closes the hearing on LB513. Thank you all for coming out today. Have a great weekend.